Hi, everybody. This is Susie Exposito. I'm a cultural columnist at the LA Times, and I'm so stoked to be here with the CEO of the Latin Recording Academy, Mr. Manuel Abud. Thank Hola. you so much for making the time to chat with me today. It is great to be here, pero quita el Mr. Manuel Abud with Manuel. <laughs> Simplemente Manuel. <laughs> Muchísimas gracias. Bueno, um, I'm thinking we'll just we'll just start by getting to know you a little bit and and your professional journey, and then we'll dive into your time at the Latin Recording Academy and what you got planned for us in the next couple of years. Me parece bien. Dale. <laughs> Dale. So um, you have a storied career in television and broadcast journalism. You have previously served as president of media organizations like Telemundo and Azteca America, where you brought in the scope of international programming in Spanish. This is a big deal. So what brought you to the Latin Recording Academy? Well, you know what, life. O sea, I've always been a music lover. I've always had the highest respect for this institution and for what Gabriel and the team were doing at the time. Uh, in fact, yo me quise llevar los Latin Grammys a Telemundo cuando estaba allá. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, obviously I was not successful. Pero, you know, it's, uh, it's just been very close to this institution and really admire the mission and what it stands for. Y realmente valorar eh, eh, lo, que, lo que hace esta organización siempre me atrajo muchísimo. Y pues aquí llegué. Here you are. Now, what is your earliest memory related to music? Did you ever play music like or, or perform yourself? Mira, I grew up in a, in a house of music lovers. You know, everybody in my house, particularly my dad, loved music. And so I grew up with music. And uh, we, uh, at some point, we even have a, a record store. Uh, wow. Yes, and that, you know, it was it was a bonding with my dad, and um, yes, I, I I played and uh, and I performed with todas las corales, rondallas, grupos que te puedas imaginar. Um, grew up on that uh, type of environment in which, you know, my dad wanted me to learn to play everything, and because I learned to play everything, I don't play anything. I don't play anything. <laughs> you tried a little bit of everything, so. <laughs> Are we are we talking like guitar, drums? Todo, todo. Pero you know what? Drums, guitar, and, and, and keyboards. Pero yeah. very early on, I realized that my love for music was not directly correlated with my talent. Así que se murió, ¿ves? Nunca, nunca pasó de ahí. Listen, that's why I'm a music journalist and not a musician anymore. <laughs> music lover is a good one. <laughs> and so um where where was the record store where did you grow up in mexico city i grew up in mexico city uh, the record store was in an area called san angel mm -hmm. uh, primarily uh american music american records you were imported records oh fun yeah, so who were some one. of i was the most popular one i mean imagine i had all the records all the new records were in my house yeah. No, you must have been like the coolest guy in school. <laughs> uh, that helped. <laughs> that helps, yeah. And and so who were some of your favorite artists growing up? Well, look, I mean, I grew up, I mean, the memories of uh, music with my dad, he's a lover of Brazilian music. So mm. I, up, I listened to a lot of Bossa Nova and Samba. Uh, the Beatles were his passion. So that was a bonding. We were, I mean, I learned English by, you know, looking... In that time, you had to take the letter. So you uh -huh. check the check the lyrics and 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 that. So a lot of uh, in, you know English music, a lot of American music, uh, rock, and then at the time also the Spanish rock was starting to flourish. So you know, los españoles, argentinos. No voy a decir ningún nombre porque si no después se van a creer mucho. Pero I you know really really love all kinds of music, even opera. I mean. Oh, sorry. I have a dog in the background. <laughs> um, no, listen, people don't 
people don't realize out, outside of Latin America how incredible Latin rock is. Um, so I'm so glad that you that you shouted it out. I'm a bit of a rockera myself. Ah. Um, <laughs> but, I must, you know, when I was growing up, it was rock in English, but then it started to, you know, there were there were some pioneers there that started to create these sounds, and you know, it was it was great. Yeah, and such interesting sounds, which is why it's it's so important that we have a Latin recording academy and we can, you know, we have a venue to show these artists love for innovating, you know, not everything is about is about the United States <laughs> or England. <laughs> Amazing to be part of this organization with, with a clear mission of mm -hmm. something as, as nice and as cool as and pure as music, right? After right. so many years that you pointed out and you dated myself, uh, after so many years of, of working for a for-profit organization, now being part of, a, of, a, of, this, of this organization that has a clear mission uh, of supporting music creators and, and, and you know, it's, it's just amazing. And so you began consulting for the Latin Recording Academy in 2019. Then you were appointed as CEO in 2021. Now you started with some challenges. That year, uh, or in 2019, that was the year that artists like J Balvin and Daddy Yankee voiced concerns about representation in the voting body of the Academy. And then in 2020 came the pandemic and you helped oversee the first virtual Latin Grammys. Um, but since then, you've implemented new categories for reggaeton and hip hop. This year, you announced new categories honoring songwriters, and you've also announced uh, new requirements that submissions for album of the year must be comprised of at least 51% new material. This means no more greatest hits or, or covers, compilations for album of the year. Um, how did you decide on, on these new changes? And did you make these changes after, you know, speaking with voters? Was it the board? Did you guys have multiple meetings on, on these topics? Well, let's, uh, wow, there was, there was a lot in your question, right? I mean, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the 19 uh, reggaeton challenges to the, to the virtual, uh, the 2020 pandemic, and, and, and then now the changes. Mira, I think that, there's one thing in common for all this, which is the challenges also represent opportunities. Yes. So, you know, in, in 2019, there were noises that we were not listening closely to some of our members. ¿Y qué hicimos? Acercarnos a ellos, escucharlos y abrir el abanico. Que esta, aquí la puerta siempre está abierta para mm -hmm. escuchar a nuestros miembros. Y si alguien cree o se siente que no está siendo propiamente representado, propiamente escuchado, Lo, lo, lo hacemos. Esa fue la lección del 19. Después en el 20, cuando viene la pandemia, nos sentamos Nacho Meyer, Pepe Tillán y yo a ver qué nos podíamos inventar ahí. Y lo que parecía como un gran reto se presentó como una gran oportunidad de globalización, de sacar el Latin Grammy del cajón en el que siempre tiene que estar por su naturaleza de música en vivo. Entonces fue una experiencia maravillosa el poder hacer eso juntos. Eh, y nos ganamos un Emmy, por cierto. Y luego, okay. ahora que hablas de las, de las eh, nuevas eh, categorías, creo que es importante recordar de dónde salen. It's not our decision. What we do here is really, nosotros administramos un proceso. Son los miembros, es la membresía. Entonces, hablando un poco de ese proceso, primero la membresía durante los comités identifican asuntos que después llevan a un comité también de puros miembros y ponen propuestas muy específicas. La academia lo que hace es estar siempre canalizando y armando y organizando esas propuestas que finalmente son votadas por nuestro Board of Trustees. Entonces, no es una decisión mía ni de mi equipo. Right. Es una decisión en conjunto que parte de la membresía y que culmina con un voto del Board. Entonces, y siempre con el objetivo de mantener a la academia vigente y de estar, como te decía, con la experiencia del 2019, de estar escuchando. Siempre queremos escuchar. Aquí siempre hay espacio para todas las voces. And I mean, yeah, it's not, it's, 
you know, it's it's not a dictatorship. It's a, you know, it's it's an academy. Everyone, you know, you hear from your members, you get feedback from your members, and then you sit down and you figure out, okay, what absolutely. And you know what? Yeah. Sometimes we don't have to agree on everything. Sometimes yeah. we can disagree and we have healthy conversations. Mm-hmm. And at the end, again, I think the mission is what should be driving everything that we do. Yeah. Right? Our mission to serve, to celebrate and honor Latin music and its creators, right? That's that's what drives us. That's our driver. And mm-hmm. start from there, then it's very easy, right? Because it's you got to be inclusive and you got to, you know, oír, oír muy bien. Absolutely. I think that all the best organizations are organizations that are receptive to feedback and that engage in regular conversations with their members. Um, I think it's easy to, you know, sort of um, mythologize the Latin Recording Academy and think, oh, it's a bunch of people, you know, behind a curtain and we don't see them. But actually, a lot of members of the Academy work in the music industry. We interact with a lot of them, you know, not just artists, but producers, managers, um, publicity. We we interact with everybody. It's an ecosystem. So just thinking about, um, you know, what uh, the conversations that happened for you to make all these changes in the last three years. Um, I was thinking about how the Recording Academy in the U.S. faced criticisms about diversity among their voters, um, or just, you know, about the award show and how it was presented, you know, which genres got represented during the broadcast. Um, and now, you know, in in the interest of transparency, the Academy now publishes a yearly report on the demographics for each class of new members. So every year they'll share, uh, okay, we just had 1,200 new members join the Recording Academy. Here's the data on their age, gender, race, ethnicity. Do you think the Latin Recording Academy would consider implementing the same kind of survey for future members of the Latin Grammys uh, voting body? Look, I mean, we, you know, last year we started, uh, you know, basically putting together what we call the four Gs, which was trying trying to make sure that our membership, okay, the number one priority is that the membership is representative of the community that we serve, right? That's the number one. But what does that mean? Particularly in our case, where we have such a geographical distribution, right? So that's yeah. the, first, the first G, geography, right? We've mm-hmm. got to make sure that our membership represents all the markets. So every market, every country is represented. The other one is gender. And we're paying very close attention and have very specific metrics and we're making very good progress, you know, so that that's gen- gender. Then genre, because the, the Latin music is so rich and we have so many genres that are so within, many. within within our ecosystem. So also genre. And then the other one, the other G is generation. Mm. No, because we want to have that representation of the younger generations coming in. So yes, we are very closely monitoring those. Um, we, we don't make it public, but I, I don't see why not. Thank you for answering my question. I told you you were in the hot seat, but I think I think you're doing great. Tortura sigue, así que dale. las buenas. No, thank you for answering my questions. Um, and so, speaking of, you know, one of those G's that you mentioned was gender. And I am so excited to see that you recently, uh, that the Academy recently appointed two new members of the Board of Trustees. Um, You have the famous songwriter, Erica Ender. She famously co-wrote many hits, including Despacito. Um, And you also have Maureen J. Wrighty, uh, who's the CEO of the Paley Center for Media, which works to preserve media culture through archives. Now, what do you think these women 
can bring to the table while serving on the board. Wow. I mean, mira, para empezar, fantásticas. I'm super happy, super energetic, smart, creative. Uh, I mean, they, they, they're going to bring so much that it would be even unfair to say, to, to try to number their contributions. You know, I'm really looking forward to their contributions. But I think very importantly, they personify, personifican la excelencia, la diversidad, la energía de lo que ya de por sí es un gran board. Yo, déjame aquí darles una flor a mi board porque tengo un muy buen board. Son mm -hmm. super supportive. Y entonces la visión de, de Erika y Maureen a mí me tiene super excited. Yeah, I'm excited too. Um, I mean, what a, a two two really powerful and smart women. Um, so that's sí, it's no, great y, to see. Y me encanta, mira, la energía de ambas. Tuvimos, estuvieron en nuestra primera reunión. Eh, both of them super smart, super energetic. I mean, I, I'm I'm thrilled to have them. I'm we're so happy and honored to to have them join our board. Very cool. So. For those who don't know, the Latin Recording Academy was founded in the United States in 1997, and since 2000, the Latin Grammy show has only taken place in cities across the U.S., Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Miami, New York, and Houston. Now, the Recording Academy has recently announced a partnership with the Junta de Andalucía to host a series of live music events, including the 2023 Latin Grammys, um, which will happen over the course of the next three years. So when did that conversation begin and what motivated the Academy's decision to have the awards in Spain this year? All right, let's start from the top. Primero, no ha habido un anuncio de parte de la Academia Latina de la Grabación. So the Latin American Academy, we have not made an official announcement. Okay. Stay tuned. It's gonna happen. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Uh, well, what La Junta de Andalucía announced that they were doing this, you know, partnership with us to explore, you know, having the Latin Grammys in a city in Andalucía. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the partnership also looks for different events during the course of the next three years. Todo empieza con nuestra estrategia de globalización. O sea, para mí uno de los principales puntos que tiene como potencial de crecimiento la Academia Latina de la Grabación es su carácter global. Hablábamos hace un rato de la, de la diversidad geográfica. Entonces, el buscar salir de estas fronteras es parte inherente a esta, a esta estrategia de crecimiento y de expansión global. Eh, las pláticas con España empezaron ya hace varios años El año pasado hicimos un, un Latin Grammy Acoustic Session en Madrid eh, y de ahí la Junta de Andalucía se acercó a nosotros and unsolicited offer to, to, to bring the Latin Grammys or activities around the, the Latin Recording Academy in Andalucía. So that's, that's how everything started. They've been promoting a lot of tourism and cultural development. That's right. I mean, um... You know, with with the Latin Recording Academy being an international organization, um, as you explained, it makes sense to start branching out to other places beyond the U.S. Um, and to me, I mean, hosting an event there makes a lot of sense economically because Spain has invested heavily in its music tourism. Um, it's actually the number one destination in the world for music festivals. Um, and so, you know, you have festivals like like Primavera Sound, which is also becoming more international. Um, and so this is more of a fact checking question. I read in the Spanish newspaper Al Dia that the, that the government of Andalusia offered the Latin Recording Academy 18 million euros or roughly over 19 million dollars to put on a series of events over the course of the next three years. Is that true? Bueno. Again, the formal announcement is going to come soon. The number, let's say that is in the ballpark, but remember that it's over three years right. and, and a series of different events. So let's yeah. say that it's close. Uh, but again, the formal announcement, the official announcement and the final, you know, it's a very complex, 
you know, series of, of agreements. In fact, when, when Andalusia made that agreement, I very clearly said that we we're not prepared to announce that we we're actually moving to a city because okay. we were still in the process of securing, you know, the uh, the collaboration of our broadcast partner. Univision has been playing a very important role here. So that's right. why it's not been an official announcement from us. Pero ya estamos muy cerca. <laughs> okay, we are just, we are, we are so excited to find out. <laughs> <laughs> um do you do you think you can tell us maybe how soon or are are you still in talks? Yo te puedo decir que no, bueno, ya estamos casi casi ahí. O sea, okay. you never know, right? It's not final until it's final, pero ya uh -huh. estamos casi ahí, yo te podría decir que ya es una cuestión de semanas. Okay. No, además ya el tiempo está encima. Okay. Ya decirlo pronto. All right, I I cannot wait. <laughs> um, now, I mean, I don't know. I I'm excited about it, or I I think it's like I think it's really intriguing um, to think of the Latin Grammys becoming a more like becoming the kind of event that travels, you know. And and um, however, this move to Spain it raised concerns for many Latin music fans. Um, some people argued that the Latin Grammys should take place in Latin America because many, if not most of its members reside there. Um, now, it made me think a lot about events like the Olympics or the World Cup. Um, would you consider different cities or countries to host the Latin Grammys in the future? And what would have to happen uh, for that to be a possibility? Claro, of course. Not only will we consider, we've been considering different cities. In my mind, the vision is, you know, Latin music is global and, 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 and we should be representing our, our music makers globally, not only in our region. We should, we should go beyond our, re our region. I mean, I mean, our music is so important and so relevant worldwide. Mm -hmm. that I absolutely see Latin Grammy Week happening in different places uh, and creating that excitement. I mean, you know, you should see the, you know, how excited the, the, the you know, all the, all the people in, in, in different cities are. Yeah. Um, and so three years into your tenure at the Latin Recording Academy, uh, this is my last question. What are some things that, you're proud of accomplishing during your time with the organization. Mira, I'm very proud of my team. O sea, mm -hmm. la verdad es que we've been, we've, I have a great team that is, you know, my, my, my management team and the staff are, are amazing and they believe in our mission. I am very proud of our membership and we're serious about this global expansion. I mean, mm -hmm. just last year we did, you know, acoustic sessions in, in Brazil, in Mexico, and Spain, and you know, if everything goes well, you know, we'll we'll be much more aggressive on the international development, and uh, and just uh, also, you know, what also the the social media side, our presence in social media has has grown dramatically, and continue developing content that is relevant and that is consistent with our mission. Absolutely. Um, and it's it's great to see these changes happening in real time. You know, I feel like uh, I've I've been covering Latin music for the last 10 years. Um, and it's amazing to see how much the organization has grown since then. Um, so thank you so much, Manuel, for making the time to chat with me. Uh, congratulations on your successes, and I look forward to seeing what's next. Al contrario, thank you, and thank you to LAMC for having me. Uh, it is great to be able to uh, to talk to all of you, and um, stay tuned. We'll uh, some very interesting news are coming. Yay! Gracias, LAMC, for having us. Woo! <laughs> Viva la música! Viva la música! <laughs>